Hello, fellow foodies. Thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, your host for Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. You may recall me mentioning some of my family's efforts at establishing a garden this spring. We began work on sprouting seeds in February and March, and as those little seedlings grew and the weather warmed up, we were able to move them outdoors into our raised bed garden. Not all of them survived, to be honest, but the ones that did are doing really great, and we're already reaping the fruit of our labors, pun intended, um, munching on some amazing fresh cherry tomatoes and sweet peas, and I've got some gorgeous zucchini blossoms um, ready to harvest soon as well. Now, in addition to gardening, I've spoken a lot on the show about ways to reduce your waste in the kitchen. Um, And we can do this through fermenting veggie scraps, and that's really one of my favorite ways of getting some added value um, from your produce. But what if we could grow new food to eat from those scraps? Is that even possible? Well, I came across a great blog piece written by the guest for this episode that addresses that very question. Let me take a moment to introduce him. So Dr. Chris Gunter is a professor of horticultural science and the extension vegetable production specialist for the commercial vegetable industry in North Carolina. And he's working with commercial vegetable growers to maintain a high quality of life through the use of integrated, economical, and environmentally sound production practices. His main emphasis is with solanaceous plants, so that includes things like tomatoes and peppers, as well as cruciferous vegetables, and that includes plants like cabbage and broccoli. He's also a leader in the area of fresh produce safety for the fresh produce industry in North Carolina. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for coming on the show. It's it's so great to have you here. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. Great, so why don't we start by just telling us a bit about how this all works. So in your piece, you wrote about vegetative propagation of vegetables. Well, let's start with what is vegetative propagation? Well, plants can be produced with seeds like you have in your garden where you started the seeds and then transplanted them outside. Or there are some plants that can be Um, grown from cuttings of other parts of the plant. So a cutting from a stem or a cutting from the root, which if allowed to grow, will go ahead and generate a new plant. Okay, that makes sense. So can you do this with any kind of plant? Like if I have a zucchini that I brought, bought at the store and I want a new zucchini plant, can I, can I do that with, with the fruit? So there's a, two ways to answer that. There's a short answer and a long answer. The the short answer is the average person probably couldn't do that from a zucchini fruit because the the plant itself um, doesn't have any seeds that are mature inside. The zucchini that we buy at the store is usually immature and the seeds haven't had a time to develop and become viable um, so that you could plant them. But if you were a scientist like me, you could, in theory, take some of those cells from those zucchini plants and grow them in tissue culture in a laboratory Mm. and then generate a new plant from that. But that's pretty advanced. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's that's necessarily the way most of us will go um, at home. But why don't we start with uh, some examples of things that don't require tissue culture Um, So you mentioned your work is on um, around cruciferous vegetables and solanaceous vegetables. Is it possible to do with those or are we looking at other plants more in the Amaryllidaceae family like onions and garlic and so on? Sure. So the easiest way to think about it um, is plants that um, we're already eating the vegetative tissue of, um, you can usually get them to regrow from a part of that plant um, that's left over from a kitchen scrap. So something like, think about something like lettuce, for example. Lettuces, um, we eat the head of the lettuce, but the part that we cut off of the head is really the stem and whatever remains of the 
of where the roots attached to that lettuce plant. Um, sometimes you can see those roots still on the plant if you buy something like um, hydroponic lettuce where the roots are wrapped around the stem and placed in that clamshell that you get at the grocery store. So if you could take that, if you could take that head that you've cut the leaves off of and re-root it, you would get a smaller head, but it would continue to grow. The lettuce plant itself would continue to grow. That's amazing. So you can take something that you just buy at the store, chop off the top or the leaves of the lettuce that we would normally eat, and then just put that base part into the soil and you have another head of lettuce. That's great. It's like, you know, two for one kind of deal, but you have right. to stick it That second head. head though does tend to be a little bit smaller and it does take some time to do that. So it isn't an overnight. Okay. That's good it's still a plant. It's still got to grow. So yeah. Yeah. And as you found out from your garden, everything has to go right. So even if you have the right parts, doesn't necessarily mean everything lines up to, to make that thing grow right. Yeah. Well, and your part of your work is with the North Carolina um, Extension Service. What what kind of services do you extension agents offer? Are there resources in each state on how to best grow vegetables in those different climatic zones? Yes, almost every state has a cooperative extension service through their um, land grant university, like NC State is our is one of our two land grant universities in the state. And almost every state that has a land grant uh, university can help you um, understand how to grow, how to garden specific for your state and your area. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think that's something that's important to think about because not everything that we bring home from the store may do necessarily very well in our particular growing zone. But being based in North Carolina and the Southeast, are there, are there certain plants that you've observed to do really well with this kind of um, method? Well, you know, some, so I work with commercial farmers. So um, the farmers that I work with are growing um, commercial scale produce and, to sell at the farmer's market or um, wholesale to your local grocery stores. And there are some plants that we, um, grow already using vegetative cuttings. Things like potatoes. If you've ever grown potatoes in your garden, you know that you just take a piece of potato that has an eye on it and plant that piece of potato and it will generate a new potato plant, right? So we do that commercially in potatoes as well. We just do it on large acreages, um, planting cut pieces of potato. That's amazing. Yeah. And so for you have vegetative cultivation of potatoes, what are some of the other types of plants that are grown that way? Is this only for um, the Solanaceae or are we also growing sweet potatoes that way? Oh yeah, sweet sweet potatoes. And North Carolina, you know, we're number one in sweet potatoes. So our growers who um, grow on a large scale do the same things that you would do in your kitchen to try this at home. So when you have a sweet potato that's um, older, it will start to sprout. And probably if you haven't gotten through your sweet potatoes fast enough, you've seen those sprouts in your own kitchen. So from the commercial grower side, we would plant small sweet potatoes out um, in a raised bed and allow them to sprout. And then we would harvest those sprouts and those sprouts would be used to plant this season's crop. So that would be a uh, really good example of um, vegetatively propagating the sweet potato vine in order to get new um, sweet potatoes during the year. Awesome. And you can do that at home. Yeah. So when you're, when you're doing this at home, what types of beds would you recommend? Are you talking about like a raised bed or can people just bury it in the dirt in their backyard? How much preference? Well, yeah, so that's a good question. You know, it, it always varies on the location and the site that you're trying to plant your garden in. Um, if your drainage is is poor in a, in a site where your garden is, you may want to pull a raised bed up. You know, it doesn't have to be um, a very tall raised bed with, you know, sides and, you know, like a box type garden. It can just be 
um, a mound of earth that you pull up from the surrounding soil, and that helps the roots as they develop stay out of that kind of overly wet area. And so some people will do that, you know, with a with a rototiller and then rake up a nice raised bed um, and then plant into that. And that's an easy way to keep the plant roots from getting too wet, um, staying too wet for too long. I, I, being a botanist, I often think about my garden in terms of plant families and it's super sure. nerdy, but that's just <laughs> how my brain works. So I'm like running through this mental list right now. Okay, we have Aceraceae or salads. Right. Um, what about Brassicaceae, the cruciferous vegetables? Can you yeah. also do this with them? Sure. In fact, if you've ever grown broccoli um, and harvested that large broccoli head, you've probably already seen this in your own garden. So you, when you cut off that broccoli head, oftentimes the, the, um, the buds in the axles of the leaves will begin to form new broccoli uh, heads, much smaller, of course, but, but will oftentimes break into new um, broccoli florets on the sides. And those can be harvested and eaten for sure. Yeah. And the same can be said for kale, right? And it's oh, yeah. Brassica species. Yeah. For so you sure. Can you can harvest. harvest kale selectively um, over time just by harvesting leaves up the plant. Yep. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going through my list. I'm, I'm actually looking outside <laughs> through the window at my garden. Oh, right nice. Now. And I'm like, I'm like, Ooh, what else do I have out there? I know I have, I have some, um, allium species. So onions, garlic, mm -hmm. how does one take just your scraps from, let's say just something simple like a green onion, those nice skinny green onions that are so delicious on salads, like can't, and they usually are sold with the roots intact. Yes, how do, how absolutely. Do you do yep. You could, you could do those the same way. Um, you're not going to get a, a huge onion out of those uh, when you try to regrow them. But if you start those um, roots and that sort of root plate right there where the, where the stem and the roots meet um, is that compressed stem, um, take that piece that we would normally cut off and throw away. Just take that piece and reroot it uh, maybe in a small pot on your windowsill until, you, until it gets a chance to start growing. And then you could move that back out to your garden. Uh, once it's established and, and growing, and you'll get another um, shoot of, of garlic or of onion right off the uh, center of that. Oh, that's amazing. And with garlic, can we just take the cloves or how does one, is there yep. any preparation needed because those cloves are kind of dry? Do they need to be moistened first? So I, just by planting them in the soil, you'll, they'll become moist and, and start to germinate. Yep. You don't have to do anything special with those. Oh, that's great. So this is kind of like foolproof gardening. <laughs> well, if there's any such thing as foolproof gardening, <laughs> it's it's a unique experiment for sure. Because you know some people um, have had a hard time sourcing seed uh, for their garden this year. So it's a it's a sort of a fun way to see is this going to work? Can I do this in the future? Yeah. No, that's so true. I think that. I mean, it's it's an exciting time. It's, I mean, it's right now is a strange time. Let's preface it that way. It's a strange time because of everyone being still, you know, largely isolated at home. Um, but when it comes to food and health, it's an exciting time because I feel like a lot of people are starting to rediscover their connection to their food and are really making attempts at growing things and starting gardens and, it's such a great thing to get engaged with, especially, you know, if you have kids at home, it's just the awe that they feel when seeing something grow is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah I, I teach a vegetable production course at the college level um, to students that are juniors and seniors just about ready to graduate. And it's amazing even in, in my um, class to see folks who have never had the opportunity to garden themselves. They grew up in an area where they never had a garden or their families never had time to, to enjoy a garden and to be able to plant plants, you know, plant vegetables in the garden and harvest them during the course of the class. Um, you know, it's really amazing to see even, even adults that are taking the class 
who've who've just never pulled a carrot from the ground to to know what does that really look like when we grow this you know how does that work yeah no it's it's such a it's such an amazing experience and eating the fruits of your labor i think is awesome too yeah. there's just something to be said about that freshness and the the nutritional yeah. value that's the best part right yeah, yeah. um it's funny. I had a class experience once where we were on a plant walk and these are, it was a new class, new students. And, um, you know, we stopped by a mulberry tree and I started eating it and they said, Oh, what are you doing? Dr. Quinn? You're going to die. You're eating, like, it's a, it's a mulberry tree. It's okay. You can eat this. There's, there's such a disconnect sometimes with, um, with where food comes from. Um, especially, you know, from wild foods, but I think gardening is a great way to, to get started with that reconnection and what better place to start than with vegetables that you already enjoy, that you're already purchasing and bringing home. If you can recapture those, that's, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah. 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 It's like a two for one. Like you said, you buy one, get one free. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants a bargain, right? There you go. That's great. Well, okay, so we've spoken about asters, brassicaceae. Um, what about plants that, um, well, what about beans in the Fabaceae? Can you, can you do sure. this with bean plants? Yeah, in fact, um, well, beans are so easy to grow. If, if you just have dry beans in your, in your kitchen pantry, you know, we all have these like staple foods in our pantries that we, that we almost never eat, you know, it's like, well, I've got this bean mix, you know, sometimes it's even like a, you know, maybe somebody gave it to you as a gift, you know, and you've got this bean soup mix, you know, but, but you never ate it and you have these beans in there. You can take those beans and germinate them and grow. Uh, and beans are very hardy, you know, beans are easy to grow. So even if the seed is a little bit old, um, you can usually get a plant to, to grow from those. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, especially when sourcing seeds right now is so difficult because of the high demand. You could have a garden just waiting for you in your pantry. <laughs> right. Not even realize that it's there. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, let's talk about culinary herbs. Um, you know, I, I love growing things like basil and rosemary, a lot of those mints in the Laniaceae family. How amenable are culinary herbs to vegetative propagation? So some of them are really easy to do. Um, you mentioned basil. Basil is one that's super easy to take a cutting from a basil plant and it will root, you know, given the right soil and the right moisture, it'll root and you can regrow a new basil plant from a, a shoot cutting. Um, one thing you got to worry or be careful about is, you know, when you cut the shoot off of the plant, it doesn't have any roots yet. So if it is a big piece of the stem full of leaves, those leaves are going to be losing a lot of water while this plant is trying to grow roots. So oftentimes um, we recommend just cutting off the majority of those leaves or, or a large portion of the leaves in order to reduce the amount of water loss. That gives the stem a chance to push out new roots um, while it's while it's still in the soil and growing. That's amazing. Yeah, a really good point. Um, it's just fascinating how plants are able to do this too to to generate roots from stem tissue. That that's um, yeah, it's very unique. We're we're not growing new limbs from our from our body for sure, exactly, but, exactly. but they sure are. Beyond these, are there any other favorites? What about things like celery or carrots? Right. So um, celery is a great, great example. You know, the majority of the celery plant that we eat is all leaf petioles. So we're eating those um, celery stalks. But the first thing we do when we get home and, and prep the celery is cut off that um, that bottom of the celery that's where the roots would have attached and if you just pick off your celery stalks all the way down to the inside you can see that little tiny sort of um, primordial 
uh, celery plant hiding inside there. If you go ahead and try to root that again, it will, it will with luck, root, and you can get that, um, that internal celery head to green up and start growing new petioles, and you're off and running. That's great. I love that idea. That's now, the important thing to remember, though, is it's not going to look like the celery you bought at the store, right? Because it's <laughs> going to have leaves at the top of those petioles. So it's important to let those leaves grow because that's what's providing all the nutrition for the for the plant to grow. Like that's where all the photosynthesis is coming from. So leave those on there, let them grow up. And then when they're ready, you can pull them off. Well, with all of your work, um, both with commercial um, producers and with students and um, the community, do you have any special tips that, that you'd like to share with them for gardening, either through seed gardening or vegetative um, propagation? Sure. Yeah, so I think, you know, with everything that involves plants, patience is needed. And mm -hmm. we have time now for patience, right? We've got nothing but time on our hands. So taking the time to um, grow some seeds um, or uh, start a new area in your garden with a kitchen scrap that you're going to try really allows you to see something new you sort of witness something new by doing that. And I think, you know, you have time now to to look back and say, okay, what 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 did I enjoy about gardening in the past, but I haven't had time now because I've been working or now we have some time to go back and and try that again. You know, let's let's try them again. Like you you mentioned earlier, you had some old seeds in your um pantry that were that you were saving from last year's garden get those old seeds out and try to grow a new zucchini plant or cucumber plant from from last year's crop and see that what happens how does it look does it work don't be afraid to fail yeah yeah well i fail a lot in my garden <laughs> <laughs> my friends think it's hilarious because I'm supposed to be, you know, the, the plant lady, but um, I have a brown thumb. I'm very good at finding plants in the wild and killing them and ripping out their chemistry to study in the lab, <laughs> but <laughs> keeping them alive in the garden is, but you know what, I'm, I'm determined this year is going to be different. I'm going to give them every more year, right? <laughs> exactly. It's my new, my new resolution. Keep them alive. <laughs> there you go. Well, do you have any specific resources or places you could send people to kind of um, read up? Maybe are there technical documents provided by state extension services for local gardening? Uh, yeah, we, in fact, we have a really great uh, extension gardening um, page that, that um, I can give you the link to. Um, but if you just, if you just Google um, the your state and the extension gardener uh, information for your state, you'll come up with a ton of resources. Um, for us in North Carolina, we really have a strong master gardener program. Mm -hmm. And the master gardener program, for those of you who are really interested in gardening or learning more about gardening, is a great way to really dig deeper into some of the science behind um, plants, uh, it's a volunteer organization. The the um, extension service in your state probably has information for you on that. But but master gardeners um, usually are the people who answer questions for homeowners when they call the extension offices. Um, it's usually master gardener volunteers who are that first point of contact. Um, and so you learn a ton about what goes right with plants and how to make plants grow and also uh, what can go wrong with plants and what's killing my plant. Um, and those kind of things are really good as a gardener to find out so that if you start to see something in your own garden, you can jump on top of that early and um, take action to prevent it from killing your plants. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I discovered some slugs in my garden the other day. My my little mm -hmm. cucurbits have been suffering. I'm like, what's happening to them? And I saw the little slimy critters. <laughs> yep. And this year's real bad because it's been so wet. Yeah, you know, they, yeah. They like that moist environment. But you know, you can just pick them off, and the plants are rebounding now. They're they're happy again. So I think, yeah, yeah that's that's so true. If really getting on top of the problem right away is so important. Do you find that it's faster when you when it comes to vegetative propagation than, than growing something from seed? 
Yeah, it sure can be. Um, if you think about um, some of these garden seeds uh, germinate quickly, but others take quite a bit of time. Um, some of them have really specific requirements for moisture, for temperature, that, that if you were to try to grow it from seed, um, it would be difficult, you know, in your home to do that. Um, but by planting some sort of piece of the plant, you know, a cutting like that, you can often get um, get a, a jump start. And the, you know, the perfect example, we talked about it already is potato. You know, the, if you think about a potato and your listeners probably already know about this, but you know, the potato is full of starch and starch is that stored energy that the plant needs in order to grow. And the potato's strategy is uh, store its starch there, store its energy there. And then when the time is right, germinate those eyes and allow that energy to be converted into growth for those um, growing shoots. So when we use a piece of, of a plant like that, that's full of, of stored energy, it really boosts the, the uh, ability of the young plant to grow and thrive before it can get out into the sun and start making its own food. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really great point. So I have lots of ginger root and have turmeric root in my oh, yeah. What can I do with those? Can I? Yeah. Ask so question? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Both of those will grow. Now you know those are tropical plants, so they're they're not going to want to be in cold soils, and they're not going to want to be in a cold environment. But it's summertime now, so um, if you grow them now, they'll start to germinate. And you know, ginger is a perfect example when when you think about ginger you know, that part of the plant that you're actually um, cutting to put in your salad or make a dressing or something like that, that you're grinding the ginger, that um, plant part is a rhizome. So it's essentially just an underground stem. So just like the potato, it's got eyes that will germinate and start to grow. And it's full, that part of the ginger that we eat is full of stored energy. So it's waiting for the the right conditions to come back, then we can grow a new um, ginger plant. But I will say, you know, once that cold weather hits, you're going to want to pull those really temperature sensitive plants in because they're not going to want to be in the cold. Yeah, that's a great point. I have, I have a little Meyer lemon tree that's outside right mm -hmm. now, but I have it in a pot because I know as soon as it gets cold, it's, it's not going to like that. So much. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's another, you know, those are, that's a really good example. People, um, people have done that for a long, long time, you know, um, taking those tropical plants. Think about something like a pineapple, mm -hmm. you know, a pineapple you cut the top off of um, and throw that part away. But that's, but that's throwing your money away because that, that top is basically a new uh, baby pineapple ready to germinate if you can keep it alive, right? So, <laughs> so if, you, if you root that top um, in a pot, like you said, and, and take it outside, keep it outside, and while it's, if it, if it grows and germinates and everything, you can then pull that pot in over the winter, um, and then next year pull it back out, and if you're very, very lucky, uh, you will eventually see it send up a stalk on which the new, um, the new pineapple flower uh, is growing and that pineapple flower will pollinate and turn into a little baby pineapple. <laughs> That's great. And from, from what I understood about pineapples too, is it's, it's a multi-season endeavor, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. Yeah. So you have to really be dedicated. To but for someone who has their own Meyer lemon tree, it sounds like a perfect thing for... <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I have a, I have a solarium attached to my house. So it, it allows me to keep some of these more tropical plants uh, um, alive during the cold months. So. Oh, great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing everything I can to keep them alive. So we'll see how this goes this year. Good deal. <laughs> great. Um, well, I did have one other question too about, let's say that you grow something vegetatively and it actually goes to fruit and creates its own seeds down the road. Can you harvest those seeds and, and plant those in the next season? Are those going to be viable? Well, that's a great question. So first we got to talk a little bit about maturity of the seeds. So 
a lot of the vegetables that we eat, even the ones that have seeds in them, frequently those uh, vegetables are harvested before the seed inside the veggie is mature. Mm. So if you think about something like zucchini, you know, we talked about zucchini. Oftentimes the te- most tender zucchini are the ones that are the youngest and don't have hard seeds inside. Now, if you're like me, if you don't harvest zucchini every day or every other day, your zucchini will immediately become gigantic zucchini full of hard seeds, right? And so if you wanted to grow a zucchini next year, From those seeds, I would just leave the zucchini on the plant as long as you can. Give those seeds inside a long time to become mature. And then you can harvest those seeds to dry them down and save them for next year. Now, the problem with that, though, is remember, the seeds inside came from the cross or the zucchini that we eat comes from the cross in the field that was done to produce that plant seed. Mm. So in your garden, you don't have those same two zucchini plants that made that cross, right? You have the plant that was in your garden and any other zucchini pollen that came to your garden, either from other zucchini plants in your garden or from your neighbor's garden or wherever the bees came from, Um, with the pollen, you know, zucchini pollen they had. So they're not going to produce an exact match for your plant. They'll still produce fruit, but it might not look exactly the same as the fruit that you planted or you got uh, in the first round. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good point. So it's kind of like zucchini surprise next year. (laughs) Right, right. But that being said, you know, um, a lot of gardeners save seed and make their own crosses in the in their gardens and save their seed for next year. And there's a lot of people who, you know, that's a that's a hobby for them. And, you know, could I cross two unique zucchini plants and get something that no one has ever seen before? And, you know, we we do that in agriculture all the time. We cross plants and try to um, discover what's the next Um, you know, disease resistant or insect resistant fruit or vegetable um, that we might grow. And you can tap into that um, community of people by looking at things like um, seed savers, you know, just Googling seed savers, you'll get a ton of people, um, both in your local community and all over the world who save seeds, uh, make their own crosses and save seeds. It's a really, um, it's sort of a next level gardening. Yeah, it's such a vibrant community. I know even in in Atlanta, there are um, seed exchange events where people will bring seeds that they've saved um, and do a seed swap. So you're able to kind of share and, you know, not just share the genetic material, but also share the know-how and the details around the qualities of each of these um, unique uh, cultivars that they're working yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. And you never know, maybe your, maybe your saved seed will be the next big thing. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I'm just hoping right now, Chris, that they stay alive and produce yeah. fruit. Yeah. <laughs> That's like baby one step steps. at a time, right? Yeah. Baby <laughs> steps, baby steps. Yeah. That's right. First, first keep the plant alive, then become a multimillionaire seed producer, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for for coming on the show. This was super informative. I feel, you know, much more empowered now to start looking at my vegetable scraps a bit differently. And um, we have an empty uh, bed, a raised bed in the garden. I think I'm going to start playing around with this and just have the kids run outside and plant those scraps from the celery stalks and uh, the onions and garlic and... um, yeah, and we'll see what oh, that'll be so much fun. This. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. I'm Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded on Zoom from home during the COVID 19 isolation period. You can subscribe to the podcast anywhere that you stream podcasts. 
We've got a fabulous lineup of topics and shows for you this season, so be sure to subscribe. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.